Is this a fun time or what? Yeah. Amen. We're going to jump right into this, okay? You guys ready to just roll? Yeah. Okay. I, I turned to Mark 3 last time, and I feel like we're going to just continue, and we're going to finish where I thought we were starting last session. That's what I believe. We'll find out and see if that even happens, but that because I'm on a journey with you. I never know what I'm doing. I just come up here and I'm yielded. When, I, when I'm down there kneeling in worship, it's not just honoring Him. I'm, I'm very humbled and honored to be in this position. I don't have a need to stand in front of you. I don't have a need to preach. It's an honor to stand here. He says, don't let many of you be teachers. It's, this isn't some, we're not on a trip and we need to be somebody in front of somebody. That's crazy. It's a very humble thing. And when I'm kneeling there, I'm, I'm literally all the time saying, Lord, you know my heart. I have no need to be up here. And God, if someone would hand you a microphone today and you would turn and face these people, what would you say? Let that come out of my heart today. Let that speak through my lips. That's how I always do that before I minister and speak. I ask him if anyone would hand him a microphone and just stand him in front of the folks that are out there, what would you say, Lord? And that's really, that's it. So I never really know. The last session, I thought I was going to teach on relationship and express some things. And we never got there. We, got, we chopped some things up, exposed some things for what they are and revealed the truth in what's really there. And it felt really circumcision to me last time. The last session felt like God was really trimming and cutting and exposing some stuff. What you see, you can become. Yeah. Right? So the God of this world tries to blind the eyes of those who don't believe. So if you don't believe the gospel is possible, if you don't believe the Christian life can really be lived the way the gospel calls you to, well, you'll walk in a blindness. Your eyes will get blind and you'll just come up with something else, some other analogy. But man, if we're following Jesus, all things are possible in Him and all things are possible to them that believe. True? Yeah. So can I live by the Spirit? Yeah. Does God want me to live by the Spirit? Has He given me the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead so I can follow Him? See, nobody's going to talk me out of that now. I've been doing that for a long time. I'm having fun. I've seen too much to be debateful right now, but I haven't seen enough. I'm going to keep on growing. But I've seen way too much to change my mind. Yeah. I've, I've lived with me in the Holy Ghost long enough to know I'm on a track here. Because <laughs> I actually like me now. I like who I've become. I'm not asking you to like me. I'm just telling you I like me. I go to bed with me, I wake up with me, it's awesome. <laughs> I used to not like me. I used to need you to like me to feel likable. And I used to live to get your attention because if you gave me attention then I felt noticeable. That was before Christ, obviously. But now I know who I am, I hang out with me. I look in the mirror and I like what I see. And I don't see yesterday. I see what I've become. And I honor Him for it. It makes me love Him all the more, David. I can look at me in the mirror and see who He is in me and I begin to love Him all the more. Because I know I am what I am by the grace of God. So it's not look in the mirror and go, ugh, and look in the mirror and think about where you've been and what you've done 10 years ago and who did what and didn't say what and trying to find value. You find your value in Christ. Now, I'm telling you, I've done this in my bedroom. I walk out of my bedroom, I have a full-length mirror right at the door like a lot of folks do, and I'll go by it and I'll just stop and go, are you kidding me, dude? Get out. Oh, my goodness, friend. And I'll talk like I'm talking to the person I see. I'll stare right in my eyes. A lot of people can't do that. They can't look in their eyes and speak good things. Man, if you can't look in your eyes and speak good things, you, you're having a hard time receiving what He accomplished through Jesus. Because what you're seeing is who you think you are apart from Him, and that's a lie. I had an administrator once who took her three days to look in the mirror and talk to herself and say, man, you are a woman of God, valuable and precious to Him. She couldn't she just look away. She couldn't look in her eyes. She felt weird. That's a false humility. That's, a, that's deception. You need to be able to look right in your eyeballs and see Him. And know that you've been made. To God, He said, you're the fragrance of Christ. You're the hope of the world in Christ. I don't know if you realize that. I don't know if you think it's some mystical outpouring, but God knows it's Christ in you. You're like the roster of heaven. You're the team of God. You're the best He's got. And He's cool with that. You ought to be too. There's no B squad. There's no, there's no bench squad. We're all in the game. We've got the ball. We're in full uniform. That's play, man. 
You're enlisted by him. You get it? There's no throwbacks. There's no substitute. You're first team. I promise you. It says to God, you're the fragrance of Christ. It says that through us, before that verse, it says through us, He diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge everywhere. <laughs> We're praying for Him to come. We know He can breathe on a city and change a city in a day, so that's what we intercede for. But if you really look at the Word, He's saying through us, He diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge. He's saying it's through you that the world knows who I am. You think of what's happened to the church over the generations of legalism and, and hardcore stuff and you shouldn't wear this and you shouldn't do that and all of a sudden you can't worship loud and be expressive and, you know, holy reverence and trying to shut down the expression of love and all this stuff. And then we fight over that and then some people that get hurt by it go to the far extreme to project back on what they disagree with and it just gets chaotic. And all of a sudden we're shooting ourselves in the foot all the time. You think about it, what really happened to the church over the years at large and how we've misrepresented the beauty of this gospel without realizing what was happening. Because if people really saw Him in us, they would want Him. Because He's beautiful. He's beautiful. Who wouldn't want a God like this? But here's what we don't understand. They only see the God that we understand and manifest. The only God they see is the God that's in you. And if you don't believe He's in you, how do you reveal Him? Oh, you can talk about Him, but why does somebody want what they can't see in your life? And all of a sudden, you reduce life by the Spirit to a doctrinal intellectual debate or a coffee table conference instead of a life lived in a manifestation of His love. You guys follow me on this? This isn't heavy. It's not condemning. It's a gift. It's our birthright. It's a, it's a privilege. It's where we're called. I'm not called to just tell you about Him. I'm called to show you who He is. People say to me, well, did you lead Him to the Lord? I gave Him the Lord. We just get so religious. Well, did you lead, what you're saying is, did you get Him to pray that prayer we're all supposed to get Him to pray? I don't know if you understand this, but my goal with people is not to get Him to pray that prayer. My goal is to love them. My calling is to love them. Holy Spirit saves the hearts of men. God saves people. I'm called to love them. And through that love, He has total access to their heart. You have an encounter with people and they walk away from that. You have just opened up a door for Holy Spirit to ravage them. They could walk away, get in their car and say, Oh my goodness, that was overwhelming. It's almost like they cared about me. It's almost like they had time for me. There was no string attached. I was waiting for the punchline. There was no punchline. It's like they cared about me with no other agenda. And all of a sudden, the presence of God fills their car and says, I've loved you from the beginning. Now they're weeping in the Holy Spirit and they're having an encounter with God because you sowed a seed. You watered something that God sowed a long time ago through a person and now increases come into their car. Are you following me? Because you ain't taking that from that person. You ain't taking that encounter. Look, I, I, have had, I can tell you so many stories of sowing into people like that. One guy's driving down the road. Jesus comes in his car. He parks on the shoulder of the road, gets out on the asphalt at one in the morning, and he's bawling profusely on his knees, getting gloriously born again. No one was there to lead him in that prayer. The seed of God was sown into him, and God breathed on it, and it burst out of the ground of his heart. Now, how are you going to take that from him? That man went on to live and grow and be integral and upright and full of character and love Jesus. Yeah? You're not going to take that from him. He's yielded now. He's surrendered. He gets it. <laughs> that sure beats pray this prayer and make sure you stay in church and do right and don't do wrong. And I know we mean well, but we're missing the whole point. The whole goal is to become one with Him and get in union with Him and have co-union, communion with God through the person of Holy Spirit. That's where my life's changed. That's what I want to try to talk about. See how I get on all these other things? It's not my fault. <laughs> I'll just blame Him. He can take it. Shoulders are broad. Mark 3, I want you to see this. Because this is amazing. Your goal... It's not to be used by God. Your goal is to accept yourself as a son and daughter of God, washed in the blood, accepted in the beloved, where rejection has no voice in your life because you're accepted in Him, where you, no man owes you anything. Where, see, here's the thing. It's a paradox. 
We need one another. I understand we need one another to fulfill the big plan of God. We, we need one another within our spheres of influence to impact the earth and to cover the earth with His glory, to lock arms and be an army rising up. Who would agree that there's a, the body doesn't say, hey, I don't have need of you. Right? There's, there's a, this, the, together this thing happens. Right? Right? Even just the assembling of ourselves together and everything involved and the way you want to broadcast out and touch all these people, live cast and stuff. Man, look back here. It takes real people. Yeah. Yeah. Look back there. That's amazing. It takes real people to participate. Yeah. It takes real people. Yeah. See, that's the camera, but there's a young man standing behind that camera on a Saturday afternoon. It takes real people. We need one another to pull all that off. But watch what I never need you for, to know who I am. I found who I am through Him, and now I can have an amazing, healthy relationship with you because you owe me nothing, so you can't take away what I've become. Come on! I need you to co-labor with me. You need me to co-labor with you. We need one another to pull this thing off. But I never need you to know who I am. Unfortunately, we've tried to find ourselves through one another and we're only as strong as the weakness around us. Whoa. And yet Christ lives in us and we celebrate that and fail to manifest that because that's not what we really believe. You guys all right? It's so quiet. <laughs> you get me nervous, it's so quiet. <laughs> I hope you're hearing me in a real good ear. Look, I've, you, you only know who you are through Him. He's the truth. He came to His own and His own knew Him not. Why? They were identified through the fall, through sin and the wisdom of the world. He spoke and He, and he lived in front of them and they couldn't see Him. They couldn't hear Him. Man, He came to redeem restore things. He came for the truth to come to make us free. He wanted to get us out of that lie so we could live in the light. He's the light of the world. So, so he came to remove the darkness that every one of us was bound in. Are you following me? There's a way that seems right to a man that has integrated, if we're not careful, into the gospel that we haven't dealt with. We've allowed it to track along with us. And, it, and if that doesn't change, all we've done is incorporate him into our life. Instead of him becoming our life. And he said, she said, still has creden credential and power and influence. And how people see me or don't see me still matters so much. I mean, some of us can be really vulnerable to this stuff. I mean, Facebook is so huge nowadays. If somebody just posts something a little negative on you, you think the whole world just saw it and you're trashed and crushed and your life's over. No, that's just their expression and their view of you. And I'm sorry that they have the ability to post that publicly and de demean you. You ought to feel sorry that they have the ability to do that and not even be phased by it and probably back off of that arena anyway and just stay secure in Christ. Because if not, you'll try to defend yourself, you try to cover yourself, you try to post something back that vindicates yourself or exposes something. And then next thing you know, you're caught in some war that you're not even called to. And it's all survival mode. You get reduced to survival instead of overcomer. Come on, don't you live insecure. Don't you let anything eat your lunch and tell you what you're not. Don't you let what people don't see determine what you do see. Because he's the light. You guys following me? Come on, man. If, watch this. If these things aren't settled in me, I honestly am not conditioned to have healthy relationship with you. I'm still needy. And when I say I love you, I'm really saying, do you love me? Actually, all I'm saying is I need you. Do you ever hear anybody talk to each other like, oh, I just love you so much. I don't know what I'd do without you. You make my whole world come alive. And I would just be devastated without you. I'm so glad you're in my life. I don't know how the world would be without you. All the music would stop. And you think that's a compliment. That's idolatry. And the reason you think it's a compliment, because you need them to feel that way about you, because it makes you feel like somebody. And now you got this weird codependent thing going on, and you're calling it love. And if you ever grow out of that and mature and realize that's not a need, the person that still needs you is devastated. 
and can't even live without you, and you go on like you're cold and callous, but it's because you don't need them anymore. It was never love in the first place. But it sure feels fuzzy in the moment. Because it's meeting that vacuum that we have, and that need to be wanted, and need to be appreciated. You have only, only, only can find that through Jesus. And only then can I have healthy relationship with Richard. Only then. Only then can this be a blessing and a good thing. Because if not, who's seen countless relationships fall apart? Who's seen countless ministry connections dissipate and turn out ugly? Who's seen countless people influenced and determined today by those things that happened yesterday concerning people? I sit beside folks like that every time I fly on an airplane. And their story's always the same. And people have decided their destiny. And they get reduced to a belief system at the cost of knowing Him. And they say, well, no, I have a belief. No, I haven't gone to church. I've had, yeah, you've had bad experiences. And I know some people can use that as an excuse and ride that wave, you know. But the bottom line is when they say, well, I have my belief systems, what they're saying is I really don't know Him and people have forced me into this thing and I feel guarded and protected, but it's at the cost of everything. Are you following me? Man, you ought to see. I've had countless times on planes with people beside me like that, and I'm on it, man. They say that stuff. I, I expose those lies. They cry almost every time. I've had stewardess more than once come and ask the person beside me if they're okay or if I'm bothering them. Because they're bawling the whole flight. The one lady cried so hard three times and people were distracted and looking and, and listening and they could hear. And, and then I heard she had di uh, diverticulitis. You don't pull that out of a hat. Or I'm sorry, that was another lady. <laughs> this lady had Crohn's disease. You don't pull that out of a hat. And when I said that to her, God became more real than the last three times she cried. So the fourth time was louder yet. So the stewardess came back and said, excuse me, honey. Oh, my goodness, honey. Are you okay? And she looked right at me. And, are, you, are you okay? And I'm like. <laughs> she hangs around long enough. She's going to be crying too, probably. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> See, because it's about people. It's about She's living a lie. When I hear that lie, if I love her, I'm going to minister to that. I'm going to speak. I'm not just going to say, oh, brother, that poor girl, she's deceived. So then Jason picks me up at the airport, and he says, how was your flight? Oh, it was good, man. But, man, people are so deceived. This girl, she's believing this and that. And I just can't believe how people are just so deceived. And all of a sudden, I'm just talking about where she's at, and we're talking, and we're going to preach, and I've never had the capacity to love her, to help her. And if I really care, I haven't even tried to minister to that. I've just located it. And passed it on that people have problems. Next thing you know, my heart's dull and hard, and I forget why I'm even filled with the Spirit of God. Oops. Wow. That's, uh, I hope you caught that. That's heavier than deeper than... Yeah. See, I'm that way. I really believe God has fashioned me to love people and be bold enough. This precious lady just today, and she's listening to me right now. Nobody needs to know who she is. But she had some wrong thinking last night, and she left early, but she came back, and she talked to me, and as soon as she came back, I told her, I said, honey, and she said, I know, but I came back. I said, I understand, but you still, and we talked, and she cried and cried, and I ended up praying with her and blessing her anyway, but I wanted to help her to never let that happen to her again, because to me, that's more important than blessing her and seeing her healed. Great, you're healed. That's awesome, but wonder if you're not thinking different. So great, you're healed, but wonder if you think the same and wonder if you have the same capacity and the next time you go through sickness, you function the same way. So now you reduce healing that leads you into deeper intimacy relationship to a point in time when you were healed and the testimony when God healed you and now you're striving to get healed again. But what's really changed in your heart, your capacity, your vision? I just want to go a little deeper than the healing. Physical healing is awesome. Transformation of life is the goal. 
Are you guys with me? Yeah. Oh, man, I love it. <laughs> you see how alive this stuff makes me? Because we all experience life. Don't think I have an opportunity to live in the flesh and, and do all the things that we're... He so guards us and protects us in truth that the eye single, the body's flood with light. It's freedom. What I'm preaching is freedom. You know, we're singing, I'm free, I'm free. We need to understand what we're singing, you know. And I said, this is how we overcome. Well, this really isn't how we overcome. It's just fun. <laughs> how you overcome is through his blood and the word of your testimony, but you love not your own life unto death. How you overcome is becoming like him then you'll see clear and that's freedom. When you're free from you, you're finally free. Because if you're free from you, you're free from everybody else. Because you're not a target anymore. You're not a landing strip. So the proof of me being free from me is when I'm totally free from you. You know what 1 John 4 says? It says love is perfected in this. That we have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness in the day of judgment. When others are crying for the rocks and trees to fall on them. Trying to hide in the caves of the earth. To avoid His coming in His presence. Read your Bible. You have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as He is. See, we think that's power. The whole chapter of John 4 is He is love, He is love, He is love. It says, as He is, so are we in this world. See, you can't tell me the goal of the gospel isn't transforming us back to love. Not getting our names in a book of life, transforming us back to love. Guess what love does? Love never seeks its own. So guess what love does? Never takes an account of a suffered wrong. It doesn't say sometimes doesn't. It never does. Why? Because it never seeks its own. Do you see why you have to deny yourself to follow Him unless you love less this whole exclusive list of everything dear to our hearts? You'll by no means be my disciple. Why? Because one of those things on the extensive list will get in the way and roadblock you. You follow me? And all of a sudden you'll think it's cool and possible to stand before God on that day when you look into His liquidy fire eyes of love or whatever it's going to be like. It'll be absolutely overwhelming and amazing. And you're going to look and you think you're going to stand there and say, oh, oh my God, I'd have believed in you if it wasn't for my spouse. You won't even be able to think that. You already know you were deceived. So why be deceived now? Oh, man. <laughs> I feel that surging anointing on me or something here. I don't know. Just so... <laughs> Are you guys all right? Come on. You know when I'm saying that, you won't be able to even think that in His presence. You won't be able to go, oh, my God, I'd have believed in you if it wasn't for the way it went at that church, remember, in 85? I mean, God, why did you let him do that to me anyway? You knew that broke my heart. Why did you ever fix my heart? I want that to sound foolish so you never consider that. You have to let people break your heart. You have to be positioned to be broken. You have to put your hope, your faith, and your trust in people to get broken like that. I'm just not going to be fragile. You're not going to drop me on the floor and break me. I'm going to bounce right back up and smile at you and love you. So you either go crazy and hate me or just see Jesus and get saved. One or the other going to call you in such an account that you don't have any other choice but to hate love or become love. So you either crucify the Son of God or you become like Him. 
<laughs> That's why we walk in the light. To expose and remove the darkness. So you either have to love the darkness more than the light, or you come into the light. You don't realize how important it is for us to live the cleanest gospel and express the clearest message so people are brought into account and have the greatest opportunity ever to love Him and be loved by Him. Or to be loved by Him and love Him. Are you follow me? We've turned it into a doctrinal debate. It's a life lived and it's light. Let your light so shine before men. Do you know that light is greater than darkness? Told you I'm not a deep fellow. We talk about the darkness and, oh, this is a dark city. And, oh, you don't understand our town, though, brother. It's really dark. We don't understand that dark is never the issue. Do you know that light is greater than darkness? So did anybody... See, them lights are pretty bright. But nobody ever walked into a bright room and said, Dude, could somebody please turn up the darkness? It's too bright. If the light, if the, if, the, if the room gets duller and darker and dimmer, it's because someone turned down the light. So arise, shine, church. Your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Deep darkness will cover the earth. Or darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the light, it's on you. He's letting you know that darkness is there, but it's not the issue. The light is. <laughs> darkness will cover the earth. Deep darkness, the people. But guess what? We're like, oh, bummer, darkness. Sometimes we only intercede because of the problem. Why don't you intercede because of the problem and, or the promise and thus says the Lord? You don't, you don't pray for your, your city because you watch the news and a gang just moved in and now there's slogans and God, these people, they have no right in our city. We claim this city and cut them off, God. Get them out of the city. They'll just go to somebody else's city. <laughs> selfish, 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 selfish. Well, at least they ain't in our city. We prayed them out of our city. If they don't have faith to keep them out of their city, fine. Totally miss the heart of God, even in intercession. You don't pray because of the problem. You pray because of the problem, the answer. You decree and you declare. And watch this. To vitally, vitally intercede for your city, you have to have love for your city. Not fear and not problem driven. You have no authority to intercede over your city unless you see the value and destiny of your city. You're not just praying because it's a religious culture. You're praying because it's called to destiny. It's called to the nature of God. It's called to the love of God through His Spirit. And we have a greater destiny than what we're giving ourselves to. And God, thank you for a great hunger and an amazing awareness of God in this city. Thank you for raising up the truth in the heart of the people and teaching us, God, to influence and be everything we were called to be, to divinely inspire men to rise up and live their destiny. That's intercession. It's not God, I just repent for all this religion and God, please take away the religion. This place has become so hard, God. Even the pastors are... <laughs> I went to a pastor's meeting years ago. There was about 60 to 80 men there, all from our city. And I was excited. I was barely saved. I was just starting to pastor two and a half years saved. And I thought, man, I'm just pastoring a couple weeks. I thought, this is amazing. I'm getting to go into this. I mean, it felt like I was saying, I was like, I'm going into this pastor's meeting. I'm getting into with all these guys that are heads and leaders all over the city. And I've, I've, I've got an in because now I'm in a leadership position. And I get to pray with all these amazing men. And, and I was expecting like this incredible, crazy spiritual encounter. But I didn't realize there's all these circles, denominations, different views. And we're calling it unity meetings and peace and all this stuff and, and it, it, went in, it went in there and I'll go to pray and, and my heart was vulnerable I was in trouble God fathered me through the whole thing because I was let down I had expectations and I thought this wasn't as spiritual as I thought and then after a couple times I thought this is actually really dry and this is religious and I don't think we get what we're doing right now and then I'd start to pray and then they'd say you don't need to be so expressive so emotional you don't need to cry when you pray you're an emotionalist you're trying to stir people through your feelings and then and I'm starting to think oh well you're just religious well, that's a religious spirit and I started to do what I've seen tons of people do in my Christian life 
And I started to realize that I was right and they were wrong, so I only saw them as wrong. And then one day, something happened, and they asked me not to come back anymore. And my pastor stood up for me and he said, look, he's a man of God. Because I, 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 I taught for five minutes. They did a little five-minute teaching in the front end of the thing. And, and I was new. I was a newbie. I was six weeks there or something. I didn't want to teach. I, man, there's all these guys there, 60, 80 men. I don't have no need to teach. It was, one of those, it was the only time I ever remember it happened in this way because, you know, we say God's not a controller and stuff. But I'll tell you what. He said, who wants to do the five minutes next week? And I'm like this going, why, is, why am I even raising my hand? It was weird. I've never had that experience before. And I wouldn't put it down. And this leader looked right past me and went the whole way around the ring three times. Is there anybody? Does anybody want to do the five minutes? Who's on next? Anybody. And the third time around, he said, well, then I guess it's Dan. It's exactly how it happened. I'm not exaggerating it at all. And all he was going to do was say, well, I just wanted to give it, I wanted to give a chance for somebody senior because you're new. But he purposely went around me three times because they were bothered by me because I was too emotional, too passionate. I cried for our city. That wigged people out. Look, I cried when they weren't looking so I can cry when they are. If you only cry when they're looking and you don't cry when they aren't, you need to question what you're doing. But I cried when they weren't looking. So I couldn't help but to cry when they were. You follow me? You're not in there projecting. You're just being you. So Jesus woke me up five days before the meeting. Five days before this little pastor's meeting, he woke me up in the morning early and gave me two words of knowledge for the men and told me to preach uh, out of, out of uh, uh, where Paul said, I, I'm sending you Timothy. I have no other to send you who's of like mind, who's only seeking what is Jesus and not his own. And I looked it up and I thought 30 years into church history, the only man Paul could find that didn't have other agenda was Timothy. 30 years fresh in the church. That's a fledgling, man. That's like... We're still a peep growing up. 30 years into the church history, Paul could only find one man that didn't have other agenda but Timothy. Was the only man. And that's the word he gave me to teach to all these pastors. That we better be careful we're not just building our kingdom, establishing our reputations and our names and failing to minister the kingdom that's already here. That we're not just trying to draw big crowds and have services to make people this and that, but that we really make it all about him, etc. And I'm teaching this and people are squirming, cringing, and they're offended because who are you to talk to us like this? That was all through the room and I, I didn't understand. I'm so in, I don't even know. I'm just expecting, I'm thinking everybody's in love with Jesus. And he gave me two words of knowledge. And the one was, it was so specific, but they didn't point anybody out in public. It just said, now listen, I need to share two things before I close because I only have five minutes and I'll be gracious and only take four of those five. I was really disciplined in those days. Something happened to me since then. But uh, no, it was imperative that I didn't blow the five minutes in that setting. Believe me, they were watching that one. They'd have cut me off. When the bell went ding, they'd have cut me off. And I said, listen, there's a pastor in this room right now you're jesting with your administrator slash secretary. She's sandy blonde hair. She's 35 years old. And I gave a complete description of her. And I said, what's happening, sir? You don't realize it's happening. But the more you jest, your heart is getting knit to her. There's an emotional thing that's happening that's not healthy. And you're, there's some vulnerability developing. And the Lord would say, back off your jesting. Straighten out that relationship. At least you get burned in the fire that you're setting. And this guy sitting there and his heart is beating out of his chest because when I'm sharing the word, he knows it's him. But he's extremely reputable in the community and a major counselor. So he's just sitting there. And I said, and the other gentleman that's in this room, you're receiving finances to keep your ministry alive and yet you know it's not quite upright. Quite upright means that's compromised so it's not acceptable. You're compromising to keep your ministry alive. Look, if God's floating this boat, he'll sail it to the other side and get you through every storm. And the Lord would say to you, let him be your provider. Get your conscience clear. Clean this thing up and let me be able to bless what your hands set to or this thing is sinking. It was heavy. So they said, that's it, you're done, you're out of here. Who do you think you are? You're pointing out sin. My pastor said, look, I know him. He's my associate, this guy. He loves Jesus, walks with Jesus. And let's just see if these men rise up. Because if these men rise up, then you have to reconsider. 
Because a lot of these men believe the gifts weren't for today, and it was all that stuff in the room. So even though we call them unity meetings, we're carrying our stream in there, failing to become a river. The next week, the, the one man came up to me trembling, secret. I said, oh my goodness, I just want to honor you and thank you for your boldness. I know that it didn't look, you know, they didn't look kindly on what you did last week, but you have no idea how clear you spoke to me. He said, my heart was beating out of my chest. I was the man, that administrator, and I didn't realize it. And I can't tell you I'd have done anything, but it obviously was worth mentioning from the Lord. And he was fathering me, and I just want to thank you for your boldness, your humility, and oh my goodness, that you would hear that in prayer is amazing. And ah, whoo, I went right to her and repented and said, look, we need to, and, I, and he made it straight. And I said, would you do a big favor to this town, to these pastors, to this room? Not for me. I said, would you, for us, would you go and tell the board and the heads of this meeting that you were that man, and et cetera, et cetera. He said, why would I do that? I said, because they don't want me to come back anymore. He said, what? I said, no, it totally threw them. They're thinking that I'm way out of the box and I'm out of order, and I'm, they said I'm pointing out sin. And I said, we're praying for revival. Probably ought to get sin out of the camp, out of the leaders. <laughs> It would have been different if I'd have said, you, sir, and you, sir. I didn't. I gave them the chance to respond to Jesus. So he said, okay, but guess what he did? He never told them because he knew if he told them, they would always see him for that. And he didn't want his name tarnished, and he didn't want men to think the worst of him. Now, here's the tragedy about that one. Love doesn't think any evil. And the trouble is, we've been trained to think the worst at eyes view. And Jesus says, don't you judge with outward appearance. You judge with righteous judgment. You don't judge a book by its cover. We've been trained to think evil. We see something on the outside. We, we project and presume on it and go, oh my goodness, I bet. We see two young people and they're getting a little close. And we go, oh, I bet they're doing it. Well, if you really think that and care about them and love them, find a secret place to get alone, share your concerns in your heart and try to protect them or ask them that that was your concern when you saw they were getting a little touchy and feeling and where are you guys at? And just give them a chance to be loved rather than project on them. Are you following me? I tell the story all the time where I, I, in a rage of love trying to find a lost lady on the streets of drug addiction, I went into a crack house. I'm looking for her. I'm going to find her. And I couldn't find her. And I'm at another crack house trying to figure out which one's the crack house. And I thought, well, if I sit here long enough, it won't take long to figure it out. And, by, and a prostitute tried to pick me up while I'm waiting to find out where the crack house is. But see, you shouldn't mess with me. I'm for real. I'm, I'm in Jesus. I'm emotional right now. I'm moving in love. I want to find this lady. Don't come and pursue me for a sexual advance and a $20 bill so you can get high. I'm the wrong guy. Because she peeked in my window and said, Hey, honey, what are you doing in this part of town? And I had her wrist like a cobra. She barely got it out of her mouth, and I snared her. There was no escaping. And I burst in tears and I said, you have the wrong question, honey. It's what are you doing in this part of town? Because if you had any idea who you were and the value and honor of your life and destiny, you wouldn't be here doing what you're doing in the window of my truck, sweetheart. She's pulling, who are you? I said, you still don't get it. The question is, who are you? Because I know who you are. And I began to preach Jesus to her. And in a blind rage of love, I broke every rule we've ever written. I'm not telling you to do that. If you think twice, don't you dare do it. But I looked at her and I said, I'm looking for so and so. I must find her. She said, I said, don't play me. I know you know her. She said, why would I show you where she is? I said, because I love her. Not like a man loves a woman. I love her in the love of God for destiny like I love you. And she's so shook up by me. And I said, please get in my truck and take me to her. Now watch. A prostitute working the streets. Pastor Dan, for how many years? People know me. Everywhere. Watch. 
Middle of the night, late Sunday night, wee hours of Monday morning, a prostitute gets into my truck and I drive off. Here's the tragedy. You say, well, brother, you should avoid the appearance of evil. Here's the tragedy. Ninety-nine some percent of Christians would have saw that and believed the worst because we think evil and we're not perfected in love. I'm not telling you to go out and pick up a prostitute and test and tempt the body of Christ. I'm telling you in a moment of love where I'm trying to find this girl and I'm totally innocent and it's really cool. You know, Jesus talked to the woman at the well. It was totally not cold. It wasn't culture. And the guys were freaked out by it, but Dare said nothing. Why? Because they knew the integrity of Jesus and he broke all the rules, but they knew it was cool because it was him. And why can't the body say, oh my goodness, did I just see that? Did that woman just get in Pastor Dan's car? you got to be kidding me. He is up to something. She is going to get rocked tonight by the living God. <laughs> that's not, that's not, that's not what people are geared to think. Here's what people do. Oh my God, are you kidding me? And I thought he was, and I, and I watch him all the time on YouTube, and he, he just picked up a prostitute, and all of a sudden you got me sleeping with her. All of a sudden, you got me living in the dark. And all I'm trying to do is find a woman and save her from the dark. And the church got me in the dark. I'm not telling you to tempt the body of Christ. If I would have thought one thought about her, if, if, if I just said, get in my truck, and this thought would have said, Dan, if somebody sees it's not going to look good, I would have never put her in my truck. I never even thought about it till the next day. I laid on my bed and kind of laughed, and it was kind of silly to me. And I went, oh, Jesus, thanks for your grace. That probably didn't look good. <laughs> it was in the moment. But we set rules up that love crosses over when it's pure. My concern is that do we think evil more than we've become love? And do we see the worst rather than the best? And all of a sudden you see the worst and you call two friends and you call it prayer. Oh my God, you can't believe what I just saw. Now I'm trying to pull together. I can't imagine they did this. I'm hoping it's something else. But I just saw, a, well, don't tell anybody, but I just saw a prostitute. And you might want to call so and so and get them praying too. <laughs> and by morning, it could be on Facebook. <laughs> I'm just saying. She got in my car showed me that lady and said, don't you drop me off here. They'll know I squealed. That's the, the world they live in. When we're driving down the street, I'm looking everywhere. She said, stop looking so obvious. You need to be more, be more inconspicuous. You do, 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 do. And I said, honey, I came out of the shadows a long time ago. I'm sorry you're living in the dark. I just happened to be in the light and I've got nothing to hide and I'm on a mission. And she's like in my truck like me. But she said, don't drop me off here. I said, okay, where do you want me to take you? Watch. Take me around the back and get into that alley. Dark alley, no street lights. That's where guys pick up the girls and take them. Get a little sexual favor. Hand them a few bucks so they can get high and they drive off and can care less whether they live or die. Pretty lonely place, huh? <sighs> the only reason the man's doing that is because he has no clue. He's full of vacuums. Self-serving, self-centered at the expense of human life. Empowering her to go on and keep being destroyed, getting destroyed in the same moment. No, oh, I'm bringing it. Come on. Man, I got a growling thing going on in me right now. This thing is stirred up in me. Arr. She gets in the alley. When I pull in the, in the dark alley, I'm not afraid. to. I pulled right in there. Why? Because there ain't nothing in me going... Oh my God, you know nobody would know. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I love her. She's not what she's giving herself to. There's not an ounce of temptation there. Are you kidding me? said one or two more things to her and she freaked out and burst out crying and she said why do you care so much about me I said because I know who you are. you keep saying you know who I am I do you were created for God's image, and predestined before time 
Jesus shed his blood to redeem you, girl, so you can live upright and be a woman of God. You are not a prostitute. You are not a this. You're not. And I said, ah. I said, tell me why you're doing what you're doing. For my babies, I'm trying to raise my babies. I said, honey, you could work at Walmart and raise your babies. You have an addiction. It's blinded your identity in your life and you've lost your honor in the process of fulfilling it. And you are not an addict. You are predestined to be a daughter of the king. And I said, I need to pray for you. She crawled across my truck and leaped on me and wrapped around me. It was, she had never been held. Unless she sees love, she can never become it. And I'm okay being in that alley. Because guess what? I'm a man of God. Oh, you better be careful, brother. You better not think more highly of yourself. I'm not. I'm thinking what he says I am. Don't you get religious on me and try to put your weakness on my life. Yes, come on. I'm not following you. I'm following Jesus. And I'm not afraid of that truck in that alley. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know what's going on with me, but I'm a mess. She, do you understand? That's never happened to me. He usually keeps me together, but I do that inside all the time. That's his heart. She's never been held like that in her life. And when she recognized, even if she didn't understand it, she recognized it was something beautiful, something safe, something that didn't cost her. And she crawled across my truck and clung to me in the alley. And I'm not afraid of her. It was the summer. She's a prostitute. She might have hepatitis. She might have STD. She might have her foreheads clammy and sweaty. I could care less. I got her right where I want her. I'm holding her and I'm kissing her on the forehead, telling her who she is and blessing her and praying over her. And she's clinging to me like she's my own sister because God wants her to be. Yeah. <laughs> You tell her, well, you need to repent and you need to love Jesus. No one loves him first. Come on. Oh. Oh. Stop telling them what they need to do and become what you're trying to tell them to be. So they have something to follow. Oh, man, I hope you're hearing me. I've never been quite this undone. I usually don't manifest this much emotion. It's always inside. I'm crying so hard inside, and somehow he lets me talk tonight, today. It just got a little overboard because she's never been held like that before. But it's down in her DNA to be loved, to have value, to be restored. She's crying out, and you just think if you're not careful, she's just a drug addict. She's confused. She's lost. She needs the mercy of God. That's why she needs you to see her for who she is, not what she's done. Anybody can find fault in man who's willing to see the gold and value and destiny. In fact, I've never seen anyone that's ever truly found gold and not got real dirty looking for it. It's actually expensive mining for gold. It costs a lot. And you get crusty, dirty sometimes. I'm kissing her on the forehead, man. I'm, 
if there's anything in her, it's getting attacked. <laughs> Don't think it's going through my lips, into my saliva, and into my bloodstream. You got a way wrong view of the gospel, pal. <laughs> Just because you're afraid to kiss her forehead, don't think I am. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Greater is he that's in me isn't a Sunday cliche to me that says hallelujah when it's preached. It's what I live. I've been in car wrecks where people got so busted up, I've seen them happen. And I'm right there. God lets me get there first. I can tell you a bunch of stories because I ain't afraid to crawl in that car. I've come out. I've had their blood. I'm not telling you to do that, but leave me alone if I'm okay doing it. I've come out of there, got in my car, and thought, oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> they done dripped all over me. But man, was it fun. Watching people in convulsions with obvious head trauma just stop convulsing. Watching a kid upside down, trapped, screaming, who's doing drugs. All the pain leaving. God sobered him and I ministered Jesus to him as the police and ambulance were running to the car. Read up and followed the accident. The man convulsing and the kid got treated and released for minor injuries. His leg was crushed in the pedals, suspending him in midair. He's screaming in pain, realizing his leg's broken. Blood pouring out of him. <laughs> His friends 35 feet from the car on the road. God lays him silent on that sidewalk. And when he wakes up, he has no head trauma. A man laying against a telephone pole. Ah, ah, in Jesus' name. Looks right into my face. That's where those angel stories come from. They're just people that know Jesus and give Him in the moment. And they ain't there for a name. They're there because of His name. And they slide away. And nobody even knows what happened. I don't know. I feel great. There was this man. Man? Yeah. I just woke up. I felt great. I just... I didn't even know what happened. I just... This man's face was right here. And he... And he just said, you're okay because of Jesus. You were conked out, you were, you were moaning, and you were hurt bad, but Jesus made you whole, so you'll never suffer consequences. Remember Jesus. And as quick as he came, he was gone. And they think, ah, he must be hallucinating. It must have been the impact. That's probably what people think. Or they say, it must have been an angel. No, nope, just a man of God who knows who he is and gets involved. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you story after story. I live this gospel. I don't... Preach the stories a lot because people try to make you a hero. We're not heroes. My buddy Todd's not a hero. He's just a believer. Just a believer. It's how believers live. If my life doesn't look like the Gospels of the book of Acts, I'm just going to press in and keep believing because I need to look like him if I'm following him. So I'm just not afraid to crawl in the car. Well, I wonder if nothing happens. That's... You're way late for me on that one. That's too analytical and too easy. Well, you know, what if nothing happens? Wonder if you don't love, you're guaranteed nothing. Wow. Now you're in a stalemate. <laughs> you guys all right today? Yeah. Sorry I got so emotional on you. I don't, I'm still a little unsettled. I don't even know what to do right now. I just feel like crying and interceding. I'm not sure what's going on. Whew. <laughs> I tell you what we'll do. Let's try to read Mark 4. 3, 3, 3. Let's try to read it. Let's try to do it. Okay? Huh? I did find her. She was in an alleyway between two dealers. It's one of the most painful stories, friend. I pulled up between the two dealers. And if you know city life, they, they just don't do this. You don't pull up between two dealers, wind your window down and say, hey. And as soon as she saw my face from the alleyway, they're working her out of the alleyway to get a couple bucks to get high. Whoa. It's tragic. Trauma. I know they're dealers. 
So what? Were they going to kill me? Not. <laughs> yeah, you're just way late. <laughs> you just ain't going to mess with me now, man. <laughs> Going. You say, Dan, you're out of your mind. No, I'm probably out of yours. Yeah. Yeah. Watch this. You don't do this on the seat. Soon as she sees my face, guess what she does? Burst into profuse tears. Why? Because I represent something to her. That's in violation. There's something in her called conviction and Holy Spirit's love whispering to her, you're more than this, honey. Don't do this. Don't. And when she sees my face, she knows who I am. And I mean one thing to her. And when she sees me, she is toast. And I said, come on, get in my church. She says, no. She's got fig leaves all over her. Right? Get in my car. I'm not. Get out of here. You shouldn't be here. Oh, I shouldn't be here. Because you're here and I'm taking you with me. Get in here. I love you. They're thinking if, if they're hearing me, it's a domestic thing. And I've fallen in love with a prostitute, you know. She's brought me pleasure and now I can't, you know, she's the love of my life or something. It happens. You know, at least I paid her. Somebody paid attention to me. Yeah, I know I gave her some money, but hey, she paid attention. <laughs> that's, that's the sad story out there. Look. In the natural, these guys are at my window saying, hey, leave the girl alone. What's up with you? What do you have to do with the girl? And they got their hand in their pocket and their finger pushing through the coat. And Come on. They never said a word. That does not happen. They acted like I wasn't even sitting there. Look, I don't care if they see me or not. Jesus is Lord. She's worth his blood. He's in me, and I'm the fragrance of Christ everywhere. I should be there. Not in a room in receding. I should be there. <laughs> she got in my truck. She's crying, 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 crying. I pulled around the corner. And I pulled over and I'm crying so hard. It's, I'm so emotional. It's ridiculous. And I said, honey, I love you so much. You, you've been doing so good. You have such a good investment. She said, no, no, I got to go. I got to go. I said, no, you're not going to let this thing drive you. She said, no, I, you don't understand. You won't understand, but I'm just not ready. I said, you're not ready? She said, I knew you wouldn't understand. I'm just not ready. I said, honey, you were ready yesterday. You were never made for this. You were never ready for this. Yeah. And I said, please, I'm taking you back to the house. The girls want to love on you. No, I'm not going. And she jumps out of my truck. And she's standing on the sidewalk crying. And I said, honey, don't do this. Come back into my truck. She said, no. I said, why won't you? She said, I'm just lonely. I know you don't understand. I'm just lonely. I said, lonely? And the Holy Spirit's amazing. He's so quick. I said, lonely? Let me tell you, lonely. You're going to get in a car in a minute, satisfy someone sexually for a few bucks, and they're going to care less if you're dead in the alley naked tomorrow. Honey, that's lonely. Now come with me. And she just took off running down the sidewalk crying. The next time I saw her, her daughter called me two years now. A year later, I walked into a house she was at because I found out where she was doing drugs. There's a lady laying on the couch with nothing on. She had like two strings on her body. And I'm like, could you cover her up for me? Because she's just laying there. Pass out. She's literally naked. And her boyfriend's cooking. And the other girl that I was looking for is sitting there getting high. As soon as I turned the corner, well, he answered the door. What do you want with her? I said, listen, man, I'm not a threat to you. I'm a pastor. I haven't seen her for a while. I heard she was over here. I just love her. I want to talk to her. I want to see how she's doing. He said, oh, man, come on in. He honored me, let me in. I turned the corner. There's a naked lady on the couch and sprawled out, passed out. Just think of that life. What's going on Why they're passed out and all that stuff, man. It's a hellhole. I turned the corner and when my face peeked around, of course, she looked up and whoo! Because she's living in torment every day knowing she's where she's not called. And I sat with her and I said, honey, every time you see me, you cry. And I ministered to her and I really felt like we had good breakthrough and I felt like we sowed some good things into her. And then the next time I saw her, her daughter called a year later. She was in the hospital in a coded, whatever they talk, call it, dying of HIV. <laughs> her 
daughter called me and said, she was crying and told me who she was. I said, oh my goodness, hey. She said, please come to the hospital. Can you come? And I said, man, I'm actually home. Yes, I can come. What's going on? She said, it's my mom. I said, what? She said, she's dying and she's unconscious right now. She can't talk. But right before she was passing out and fading away and cutting off, I heard her whispering. I put my ear down and she said, please get Pastor Dan. Why? Because I'm the closest thing to Jesus she's ever seen in her life. And she wants him. I ran in there and she was already unconscious, but I believe you can hear. I just, we've had too many testimonies. I could take time and tell you some powerful things. How people came out of comas and heard every word when they said there's no way. And, and I talked to her and I got down and I said, listen to me, girl. And then I prayed for her not to die. You better believe I prayed for that lie to come off of her. And, she died like 20 minutes after I left the hospital. I ain't got answers for you on that, but I sure went in there and went after it. But I talked to her about mercy and truth in her heart. And I said, I know why you asked for me. <sighs> but right now you ask for him. You look up and believe it's possible for him to love you. And, <sighs> and I hugged her and kissed her. You can't kiss her. She's dying of AIDS, dude. I can kiss her. If you're going to pray for somebody to be healed, why are you so afraid it's going to get on you? Stop it. It's just a pitiful position, man. You got what? The flu? Yeah, I'll pray, but turn around, man. <laughs> I'm not being arrogant. I'm just being real with you. I, I can tell you too much stuff. Do, do you understand what's wrong with me? All these things I'm telling you. This is what's wrong with me. Jesus is Lord. This is real. And people get confused and lost. And it doesn't change the truth. And we've got to become it so we can give it. And not everybody jumps on. And not everybody believes. And not everybody gets delivered. But man, you give them every chance to. And you keep going after it. And who knows what she did in her heart in that moment when I was talking to her. Only time can tell. But I am not going to get religious. Cliche the thing. Let my heart get hard. And just have a doctrine that surrounds everybody's trouble. I'm going to have a heart that's alive. And I'm going to get in there and not be afraid to be emotional and get pulled all around in that thing because that's Jesus right in the middle. <laughs> Are you following me? I've been in those situations my whole Christian life. Why? Because love puts me there. I don't have to make a decision to get there. I just end up there. Because <laughs> I happen to know that you're worth it. Or he'd have never shed his blood, would he? He'd have never faced death if he didn't want us alive. He'd have never been separated from Papa if he didn't want us forever joined. Yeah. <sighs> he wouldn't have got disfigured and unrecognizable if he didn't want us to look like we were always created to look. You better see that about every human being or you'll just get frustrated with people and they'll get under your skin and rub you wrong. That's because you're alive and you ought to be dead. There's preachers by the hundreds and thousands traveling the country preaching this gospel that get offended like that quickly. I've had friends like that and I really address that stuff. I sat with a minister friend of mine who fussed a lady for a speck in his soup. And man, when she walked away, did I let him have it. <laughs> Not in a bad way. Believe me, in a good way. <laughs> Do you ever see people in airports miss their flight and screaming at the clerks and stuff? all falling apart and mad at the airlines and complaining to the multitudes. Don't tell me some of those folks don't go to church. Did you ever see anybody in a grocery line and the 18-year-old, it's her first job, and she's typing the keys and she makes a mistake and the line gets bigger and she gets more nervous and people are kicking the ground, huffing, talking under their breath, rolling eyes at each other, and now they're putting more pressure on her soul and taking, instead of taking the brick off, they're putting it on. 
Don't tell me none of those people in that whole line go to, don't go to church. It's because we've been trained to think for ourselves, and she's an inconvenience. No, she's a living soul and she needs your love and compassion right now. And she needs a Christian to lift up their voice in the middle of that 10 long line that just turned into 14 because she's in trouble. And say, listen, honey, this isn't an analogy. This is a testimony. Listen, honey, I realize there's pressure on you right now. You, you don't deserve this pressure. You're just a human being trying to do a job and you got in trouble with them keys. I realize people are grunting and snorting and you're feeling more pressure because of it. Shame on us all. Honey, you be okay. You just made a mistake. You recover. We'll be okay. And if we're not, people can find another line. But you're way too valuable to let us put that kind of pressure on you. And I didn't look at anybody or project anybody. I thought, you know what? Everybody's just going to have to hear the message and take account for their own heart. I'm not being presumptuous. Don't tell me none of those folks in that line went to, didn't go to church somewhere. I'll bet there was somebody. You're going to live at the expense of a young girl instead of step up and take that load off of her and tell her it's okay and then bless her and pray peace over her and wisdom? Yeah. That's what Jesus would do. Come <laughs> on. And I'm not talking about a new fad and another bracelet. What would Jesus do too? <laughs> it's not what would Jesus do. It's becoming like him. You don't need a fork in the road. You don't need to stop, look, and listen. Let the word become flesh in your union and relationship with him. So in the moment you manifest him, the gospel rises up. Are you following me? Okay, I'm done with all that. I'm so sorry. I have no clue what we're doing. Right now, I feel like an emotional mess. Can we, uh, can we slide this up just a little? I know, I know it's working, but just help me with that, guys. Thanks. I don't want to knock it over. That just they, were, they thought the, rec the, rec the mic was struggling because of the distance. I wanted to get a little closer. Thanks, 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 thanks. You're the best. Jesus likes you. <laughs> you guys are probably at Mark 3 by now. If you're not, you can come on up and we'll pray for you. <laughs> Mark 3, verse 13. And Jesus went up on the mountain and called to them those who He Himself wanted it's not exclusion. You're saying, well, he only called 12. Well, you've got to realize that he told those 12 to go into every nation and teach them to observe everything he taught them. He's just getting the ball rolling. He's just starting the foundation of the New Covenant, New Testament church, right? But he also told us that no man comes to the Father unless he's drawn. So watch this. The only reason you have a desire for God is because he's quickened your heart and he's drawing you to him. He's breathed through the blindness, through the sin, through the power of the world and all that stuff. He's breathed through and he's wooed you. The only reason you even care at all is because Jesus is drawing you through the Father, or the Father through Jesus. Do you get what I'm saying? Which means He wants you. I so love this. Now watch this. People are like, they just want to be used by God. They just wish they could prophesy. They just wish they could get a word of knowledge. And some of us get on this tangent. We do supernatural schools all over the place to get people to train to do the stuff. And I think it's awesome. We want to walk in the stuff. But if your foundation isn't love and you're not healthy in your identity and security, then the way God's using you or not using you is what's defining you. And then you only be as encouraged as the way God's using you. And it becomes idolatry. And all of a sudden, ministry becomes who who you are, instead of the Christ in you. It's a very, and I know pastor understands this and preaches and protects you guys from this, and I'm proud of him for that because it's something that's missing a lot of places. We just want to do the stuff and do the healings and do the miracles. But this isn't even what the Bible's teaching. Even Paul said, desire spiritual gifts. So it's scriptural to desire them, but he said, still let me show you a more excellent way. Then he took a whole chapter to talk about love, and at the end of that chapter, which is all one letter, we just put the chapters in there, it's all one letter, at the end of that chapter, he says, therefore, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. So he puts it in the excellent way order, right? Watch what he says in the beginning of chapter 13 of Corinthians. I know we're in Mark 3, it's just, you have some things you got to put up with about me. He, he says, watch this. We, we know the clanging gong and cymbal thing. We know that if I pray in the tongues of angel men. But watch what he says after that. Watch. 
If I have knowledge of, not some, if I have knowledge of all mysteries and faith as to move all mountains or all faith to move mountains, meaning all mountains, and have not love, I've got nothing. Now watch. Knowledge of all mysteries and faith to move all mountains is the closest thing to Jesus we've ever seen. That's a spiritual icon and the keynote speaker at every world conference. And we're all thronging him to get impartation. And the word says he could be flowing like that. And if it's not from the wellspring of love, it's nothing. And something about that will come out sooner or later. And it ain't going to be a good thing, I promise you. Watch this. He goes on to say, you can give all your goods to the poor. Do you know giving your goods to the poor and giving to the poor is a godly commandment? It's a scriptural thing. It's what the apostles in Acts told Paul to make sure he's conscious of. And Paul said the thing we were already willing to do. So caring for the poor is a big deal to God, right? He uses that as an example and says you can give all your goods to the poor and your body to be burned and if it's not love, you've got nothing. Why? Because you must be doing it to feel better about yourself, to qualify yourself as a Christian or to get some kind of legacy in the hearts and minds of men and all of a sudden it's not love, it's about you, your name and how you appear to people. That's why you don't let your one hand know what your other hand's doing. Because love is amazing. Love doesn't need accolade, it's not performing, it's not, hey, look at me, look what I've done. He said, you can give all your goods to the poor and your body to be burned. And if you don't have love, you've got nothing. Now, the poor is blessed because you gave all your goods to them. <laughs> but you're not receiving anything because you did it for some other reason than I love you. And what could that reason possibly be unless it's a self-serving purpose? We took a team of people out on the streets one time because about annually or biannually we get a little stirred up and feel like it was our obligation to go out and hand tracks out to people. This is years and years ago. And, and we would go, you know, we'd call it Storm the City. We called the weekend or something. We had evangelists come in and rev everybody up. So there's like 35 of us out in the parking lot and we're like, shaka taba, shaka na 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 ma shaka ba. And we got our pockets just stuffed with tracks. Man, shoke se na ma se. The truth is that this circle of 35, some of them haven't even prayed for the city for years, if ever. Some of them haven't even told anybody, Jesus loves you. But now we're all ramped up putting on ministry jackets. And we're going out, baby. We're loaded up. They run up to this first precious black brother walking down the street. They said, hey, did you hear the good news? Jesus loves you. It all sounds so Christian. It sounds like what we're supposed to do. They hand him the, the track and said, Jesus loves you. He said, hey, guys, thanks, man. I absolutely know Jesus loves me. I'm a man of God. I'm a Christian. He said, I'm concerned about you. I'm not sure you love me. I'm not sure you're not a Christian group doing your annual or biannual thing, making yourself feel good about what you say you are. That's what he said. I went, ah, get in the cars, get in the retreat, pull back, pull back. They said, pastor, you ain't going to, he, he said, he said, guys, he said, I think you need to get a grip. He said, he said, when's the last track time you handed a track to somebody apart from your church group? When's the last time you told somebody Jesus loved them apart from your little evangelistic team? He said, guys, you need to get real. You need to get a grip. And I said, retreat. And they said, pastor, you ain't going to let that man has a hard heart. I said, no, that was God talking. We're deceived, man. Let's go back to church. I said, we need to regroup. We need to repent. You learn stuff along the way, man. That was Jesus talking through that man. Because guess what we were doing? Exactly what he said. The people were going out there with all this ramped up false zeal and putting on that little ministry jacket. I handed out 25 tracks tonight. Okay. And you will a year from now when we go out again. And you might complain at work and be mad at your neighbor and walk by a thousand people in the meantime and not regard them. That's religion. <laughs> oh, God. Well, take it as this God seemed fit to correct us. <laughs> so we retreated, man. And I told him, no, that man's right. That's God talking. They're like, what? I said, come on, guys. We went back and had a little survey and talked about our lives and things. There was repentance there and we regrouped and we became more real. Amen? 
He called those to himself whom he what? Wanted. And guess what they did? They came to him. That's a good thing. <laughs> if he's calling you, just come to him. Don't play hide and seek. He already knows where you're at. Don't play hard to get. You know you want him to catch you anyway. Just go to him. <laughs> just go. You know, it's funny how we do. People are like, oh, I'm going to start this diet tomorrow. So they go and pig out before the diet. Or, you know, well, I know I'm going to church tomorrow. I feel like I need to go get saved. But I'm going to go out and have one more time, man. I've heard people say that. They say, well, my family's been praying for me. They want me to get saved. I think I'm going to church. And I know it's time. God's really calling me. I need to go out party one last time. It's like that weird worldly bachelor party thing. Well, I'm going to be married and given to one wife. Might as well go out and have a bachelor party before I'm hitched. <sighs> if he's calling you, come to him. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Then he appointed them. He appointed them. It was 12 of them. Guess what he appointed them to do? Some translations say, Ordained, the word appointed means ordained. We see that word as a big deal. Ordained, ordination. Ooh. He ordained them that they might be with him. <laughs> We're all ramped up for supernatural school, man. Let's get on with it, dude. Where's the signs and wonders? And Jesus is saying, hey, they flow out of being with me. Be with me. If you're not with me, you'll get confused with the sign. When you won't know who you are, you'll, you'll ride the wave of that. And if you ever watch a wave, man, it's beautiful when that surfer's in the pipeline in the middle and it's amazing, but it ain't long that it runs out and he's on the beach. We're not riding. Everybody says, oh, there's this new wave, man. It's a new wave. We're, why is it a wave? It's supposed to be a river that never runs dry. <laughs> We're not riding a new wave. Christian surfers. We're going to get beached if we're riding a wave. <laughs> yeah. You got to paddle back out to ride another one. <laughs> Might be fun in the natural, but it's not the spiritual life. Why did he call them to himself? So they'd be with him. Can I tell you that's why you're a Christian? To be with him? And watch what he does from being with him. And that from that place is what it's saying. He might send them out to preach, to have power to heal sickness and cast out demons. I'm telling you, with full of passion in my heart, nothing compares to your ability to be in his presence. Nothing compares to your ability to be with him. Healing the sick is awesome. To pray for somebody and watch their body change is awesome. Last week, I watched a lady for four years, nerve damage, and she hadn't bent her fingers for four years. I watched a lady pray for her, and her whole arm and hand came alive right now, and all her feeling was restored. She cried so hard, her husband cried. That's awesome. But I promise you, that is just a moment of wow and a testament. Nothing compares to my ability to go to that bed where I was staying that night and just lay there and weep and reminisce and rejoice and be with him. Nothing compares to that. And nothing's going to keep me from him. I'm the only one that has the ability to keep me from him. And he's still wooing me. I'm ordained that I might be with him. See, no, brother, I'm ordained to preach the gospel. I'm an evangelist. You're not an evangelist before you're a son. You're not a husband, you're not a dad before you're a son. You can only be the best husband and best dad as a son. You're not a pastor before you're a son. You're not a ministry leader before you're his. And everything you do has to come out of being with him. In fact, if you're not being with him, don't even go. Because you're going to miss something. There's something that's not going to pour out of you that's supposed to. It's called him. You want people to know that you've been with him because it's obvious. 
Are you following me? It would be just wonderful if we get away from this whole gifting and anointing individual. God never intended us to recognize a gift, put it on a pedestal, and build a conference of a thousand around so it ministers to everybody's needs. That's not even why a gift's in the church. It's to let that same grace multiply in the hearts of the people and train and equip them for the work of the ministry so what they're moving in is multiplied among the many. We've turned it into ministry sessions and conferences so we all throng the anointed one and his name happens to be Jesus. And we all want impartation. What do you got? And pray for me. And oh my gosh. It's so out of hand in the church, it's scary. I've run into it so much in my life and I defend against it violently. I don't even put my calendar on the schedule of our website because I don't want everybody to know where I'm at because people track you and bring the need there for you to lay hands on. It's not even what I preach. I preach He's in you. And in my personal life, it's on. But in the church, I would do you great injustice if I'd just manifest all weekend and call you out and pray for you and you'd say, wow, Dan is blowing in it, man. My whole anointing is to teach you that that's in you. Are you following me? Or we're going to miss it terribly and you'll just say, wow, that was awesome. Man, he sure walks with the Lord. No, the whole point is that's all walk with the Lord. It's amazing what he wants to do through us. <laughs> we, we've got this wrong understanding. We say, yeah, but you have a gift. No wonder if it's that I'm with him. And that everything that I'm preaching is available to you. And God's saying, hey, I want you all with me. And wonder if from being with him, he sends you to preach and heal and have power over sickness. Wonder if being with him is first. <laughs> I'll bet you. So be with him. Let me show you. Let me show you what that can look like. And I'm done. I'm, I'm just done. I'm an emotional mess right now. I don't know what's wrong with me. I can't recover. Ah, I keep thinking about that girl in the truck that wrecked me. Never, never, never been hugged like that before. <laughs> I was in a prison and a girl did that to me and the guards were over my shoulder. Pastor, you can't touch her like that. They're going to throw you out of here. All the cameras are on you. You can't. I said, ain't nobody touching me. This is right where I belong. She needs this hug like she's never needed it before. I said, I'm not letting her go. I said, I appreciate you. I'm not dishonoring you. This is way more important than the rule that you're telling me. And I just held her and nobody touched me. Nobody. They weren't communicating with the screens in the security booth. Nobody touched me because of the position I'm in. It's a higher authority. He'll turn the heart of the king wherever he wish. That girl needed that hug more than you. I ended up in an emergency room psych ward rubber room with a naked 18 year old boy that was trying to kill himself that I had known and pastored at some level and found out he was in there. His mom called distraught and I flew into that hospital and some little man walked me back the hall and left me in there. I found out later the only human being allowed in there is the hospital psychologist. And I got in there and I'm sitting on the floor with a naked 18 year old with his hair wrapped around his hands, rocking. I'm just ministering to him and pouring out, and I'm sitting across from him and easing my way in till I can get him. <laughs> oh. And this lady comes by the glass and sees me in there. She ain't happy. <laughs> She said, she got in there, right? She has authority. Who are you? I'm a pastor. I've known this young man for a few years. Haven't seen him for a little while, but I heard he was in here. So I just, how did you get in this room? The little fellow out there in emergency left me in there. What little fellow in emergency? 
I said, I don't know his name. He's a little short, dark-haired guy. He's probably five, 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 six. He said, that's a little guy. What little guy? I said, honey, I don't know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. All I did was come in and say, hey, you got so-and-so somewhere. He said, yeah, oh, yeah. And they checked. He's in this room. And he just left me in, honey. I'm just here ministering to him. He's in big trouble. She said, the only person allowed here is the hospital psychologist. You have no authority to be in this room. No one should left her in that room. She said, you take me to that man. We go out. He's nowhere. <laughs> now, I'm not saying, but I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. <sighs> and I said, honey, I'm telling you, look. I'm not making this up. This little guy standing right here, we talked to this lady. And she said about, and the lady's like, I don't know. I just didn't get much cooperation. Everybody's confused. Who's this man? Like nobody saw this man. And I said, well, honey, how did I get in the door? <laughs> how did Peter get out of the prison that night? <laughs> <laughs> He just happens to be the Lord. <laughs> He's probably not bothered by locks and keypads and codes. <laughs> wow. So I'm pleading with her and I'm saying, look, it, I didn't mean to upset anything, man. I just love that boy. I probably had tears in my eyes. I'm a mess. And she said, watch what she said. Well, were you finished with him? If I wasn't a man, I got her. <laughs> She's giving me all this grief. And she doesn't even know what's coming out of her mouth now. See, because I understand God is turning her heart. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, like a mighty river who'll turn it where he wish. King means anyone in authority in that moment. He's saying, you know what? She's giving grief, and I want to be in there with him. And I'm in you, and me getting you in there is my way to be with him. So she said, were you finished with him? And I'm like, oh my goodness, God, this is so funny. I said, well, actually, no. I mean, I was in a very critical point with him. I, I was easing in. I wanted to wrap around him because I knew his heart would break and open. And he loves me. He respects me, honey. And I know you don't know me and I'm not the hospital psychologist, but we were making great headway and I'll feel it. And she said, well, I'll tell you, I'm going to let you back in there. I'm like, oh. <laughs> she said, but you got 15 minutes. Do you hear me? 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, you ring yourself out, okay? I said, I will honor that, ma'am. Go. I'm back on the floor. 15 minutes passes by. Oh, it was like the last session. Oh, I don't want to quit. Ah! But my word's my word, and I'm a man of God. I got to ring out. Oh! Not at 15 minutes and 30 seconds, I rang out. Beep. Another lady answers. She said, Yes. I said, the lady that let me in here told me I only had 15 minutes, and I mean, I really appreciate it. This guy's been hurting, and I've been really able to love on him, and, but she said I was supposed to ring out, and she looks at me so nonchalant, and she says, well, are you finished with him? Are you like, I said, well, no, actually, I'm really in an important place, but I'm just being honorable. I was ringing out because she gave me 15 minutes. She said, sir, just stay in there till you're finished, and she walked away, and I'm like, <laughs> Love is an amazing thing. I heard a judge once say in our city, a judge, this is not the way to get reelected. Well, it's against my better judgment. But I'm going to release this young man into this ministry to see his progress. Do you know what was happening? God was speaking through his lips and his head didn't even know what his mouth was saying. You're so not limited. Love is an amazing thing. Yeah. Colossians 3, and i got to be done here. Is it 5 of 5? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Is it really that late? Yeah. Keep going. Let's keep going. we got a big lunch. we got right through this. No, you're going to have to cast this thing out on me right now. Let's see how anointed you guys are. 
<laughs> I don't know. I, I, wanna, I, I do want to go here. You guys sure you're okay if I go here quick? Yes. Yes. Now, I know the zealots are saying yes, but I, I'm listening to hear if I hear anybody in the spirit going, oh, my God. <laughs> Because I'm a yes. I, I'm, I'm like, yeah, let's go here. But you guys think you're really okay? Look, if you're done and you need to slip out and, I, and you're, you're already like, whoa, I got plenty here. You can slip out. But I feel like this is important because I want to give you a practical expression of what being with him can look like. Not that you follow me, but just to give you a practical example of what it can look like to commune with him, to be with him. Okay? Because he called them to himself that they might be with him. I was home one day and this song, you know how you'll sing a Christian song and it's awesome? And it was about dance with me, dance with me, and I'm singing this song. And the Holy Spirit said, hey, so why, like, why aren't we dancing? I'm a terrible dancer. I have no rhythm whatsoever. And I said, my heart fluttered. I felt all nervous, like, can I have this dance? I'm like, it was just me and him, but he's very real to me. And when he said that, I'm like, you, you like want to da actually dance? Well, you're singing it. Dance with me. I'm thinking we probably ought to dance. I'm ready. What about you? And I'm like, okay. And I just went off, man. I danced off through the house and did what I didn't even know I could do. We went down the stairs, up the stairs. I was with him. <laughs> It was so fun. <laughs> oh, boy, it sure beat just singing that jumpy song. He wanted me real. He wanted me to encounter him. He wanted, to, he, he wanted me to be with him. He said, Psst. hey, the song's great. You're singing. I want to why aren't we dancing? I'm like, duh. Let's do it. You know what I did when I first got saved? Closed my bedroom door every time I walked out of my bedroom. Why? Because I knew I have to open it to go back in and I made that my secret place. And there was something powerful. Because I never closed my bedroom door until I got saved. There was something powerful about opening that door. A little bit and peeking my head in there and saying, hey, it's me. It's just us, Jesus. About four days into that, I couldn't even hardly make it to the bed. Because he says, now I know you shouldn't teach that because people are looking for feelings, but I'm just telling you, he met me there because my faith was so childlike. So either I'm out of my mind right now and I need to get a life, or what I'm doing is real and he's real. And I'm about to get the most greatest revelation of my entire being. I would sneak up that bedroom like a little kid. Theologically, I know he's in me. Theologically, I know he never leaves me or forsakes me, but there's a secret place experience. And I sneak up them steps. And you, you had no idea where I was. Nobody knew I was there. It was just us. Did you see faith? Oh, I could have been stressed. I could have been let life get to me. I could have let people's words bother me. I could have just been on a prayer line somewhere and thought that was spiritual. <laughs> Questioning if he loves me. <laughs> or I could have been peeking that door open when you weren't looking. It's just me. I don't tell it much because people chase manifestations in a terrible way. and They should just come in your communion. Manifestations should just come. In fact, God, when, the reason you strive for them and don't get them like you want them is because He can't even give you a stewardship of them because you'll live from manifestation to manifestation. He wants you to live from Him. Because one day, I, I popped open the door. Did you ever have an open vision? Did anybody here ever have an open vision where everything disappeared that was in front of you and you saw what God was showing you with your eyes open? I've only ever had a couple, but they were phenomenal. <laughs> three, three that that I know were total open visions. One was a hand that came down in my kitchen and saved two little babies that were one pound nine, ten ounces that were going to die when they unhooked life support and they both lived in the instant they unhooked the thing, their, lung, their little lungs and everything. 
People say, wow, you're so awesome. Man, your prayer work, my prayer work, my whole kitchen was a sky and the hand of God was there rescuing babies. <laughs> my prayer work, are you kidding me? <laughs> wow, Dan's so anointed. We got to get him to pray for all the babies. He's got a baby anointing. No, my, my <laughs> kitchen turned into a sky. And a hand came down and picked up two figurines, little figures. And I went, ah! I said, honey, take heart. Your, hand, your children are in the hand of the living God. They ain't going to live or die. They're going to live. If I didn't have the theology I had, guess what I'm going to say? Honey, take heart. Your kids are in the hand of the Lord. Oh, I don't think like that at all. It's safe for him to show me that picture. I said, girl, you need to stop crying. I yelled at her. She's a distraught mother. You don't yell at a distraught mother when her kids are told they're going to die. I said, honey, your kids... Are... She said, well, you know, I do feel peace. I said, peace! I was so overwhelmed by the vision. You don't understand. You didn't have the vision. You think you're ready. You're not ready. I, I, I broke every pastoral rule. I'm screaming. at this. My wife knew why she was on the phone. My wife come running in because she hears me yelling at the lady and the lady's kids are dying in the natural. She's like, honey... Is everything okay? What's I said? Is everything okay? Her kids are in the hand of the living God, and I'm looking at his hand. I said, Peace! Are you kidding me? I'm screaming at this poor lady. And I said, I'm done talking about it. You just hang up and call me in the morning. I didn't handle it well. It didn't change him. I was just overwhelmed. <laughs> See, because this day I went in my bedroom, guess what happened? I hope my bedroom, because I believe he has time for me. I believe he hears me when I commune with him. Yeah. He's the God. He's the God that sees and knows everything all the time. He's amazing. Like we think, well, I just didn't want to bother God. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's pretty administratively tight today. He might not be able to squeeze you in. I, yeah. We get that thought, it's so falsely humble. I happen to believe that when I'm talking to him, it's just me and him, but yet when you're talking to him, it's just you and him. I happen to believe that he's the disciple that Jesus loved, John, when he writes, but I believe that's me, too. I happen to believe that you're his favorite, but I know I am. <laughs> I turned, I opened the door, and I said, Hey, Lord, it's me. I'm and my whole bedroom was a throne room. I couldn't see his face. But there was a throne, and an image on the throne. You're not ready for that stuff. Around the throne was myriads of angels singing, holy, holy is the Lord. And I couldn't see past them. They filled the whole view of what I was seeing as far as I could see. And I went, I said, I said, wow. I went, I said, Lord, it's me. I just, I'm just here to worship you in your presence with all your angels. And I was trying to talk, and I heard the Lord go, now this isn't the way it is in heaven. You're not going to find this in scripture. He was sending a message to me. I heard, I heard the Lord go, shh, real loud, and all of heaven silenced. That's really not the way it is. He can handle all the worship. He was sending me a message. You said, Dan, that was an evil spirit. That ain't even scripture. Heaven's always singing holies. He was sending, he said, shh, and all of heaven silenced, and you could hear a pin drop, and he whispered and said, my son is talking with me. Ah! So what do you do with me now? Lock me in a closet. Put me on a cross. What do you do with me now? Critique me, debrief me. What do you do? This isn't my fault. I sought him like a child. I was a believer, and he met me there. Because it's impossible to please him without faith. You think then, without faith, he's displeased. It's not like you think, displeased. It means he can't take pleasure in watching you manifest into who you are in him. 
pleasure is when he gets you to see, when he gets to see you and enjoy you walk in the fruition of what he accomplished through his son. He's not disappointed with you. When it says his soul takes no pleasure in you, we picture a scowling God that's disappointed with our efforts. It means, look it up, really look into it. It means he can't take pleasure in you becoming all that you're created to be. He can't sit in the joy of watching you blossom when you draw back. And we get reduced to thinking he's mad at us. If he was mad at you, he'd have never sent his son. He'd just be mad. All I'm doing is like a child seeking him. There's a problem. He said, if you seek me, you're going to find me. Oops. I guess he's faithful. <laughs> so you open the door and your whole bedroom is a throne room for a second. And he goes, shh, my son's talking with me. What do you think that did to me in that moment? I was already rolling. Now I'm really gone. You can tell. But you can tell as emotional as I am and as, yeah, as I can be, I'm making a lot of sense when I talk. I'm far from a butterfly floating from flower to flower, friend. When I'm preaching, you can hear the truth. I make a lot of sense when I talk. That's his fault. He made me see. He didn't make me a flake. He made me free. And I got a revelation to back up what you see in me. You get it? You see, I, it's not my fault that I get like that. <laughs> so since, Colossians 3, verse 1, since you were raised with Christ, that little word if means since. He's not questioning your salvation. He's not saying if you've been raised with Christ, then prove it. He's saying since you've been raised with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not the things of the earth. Why does he say that? He's a father. He knows your mind might drift to other things, and all of a sudden you let life speak louder than truth, and all of a sudden the things of the earth are trumping the things that are real and true. All of a sudden you're living by what you see instead of what you believe, and you're not to live by the things you see. They're subject to change. You live by the things unseen. They're eternal. So he's telling you in love to set your mind on the things above. Right? Watch. Why? See, you didn't just pray a prayer to go to heaven, friend. Watch. Watch why you do that. Because you died. In the gospel, you can't live unless you die. Now, you can try to incorporate him into your life, but when you die is when you live. Unless the seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. It's just all about the seed and it never breaks open and fulfills its potential. It's just a seed. If it doesn't die and fall to the ground, it'll never spring up and bear fruit. So at the end of whatever, it's still a seed. Even though in that seed is the potential to cover hills with forests. You follow me? But if that seed dies and falls to the ground, it'll spring up and bear much fruit. God showed me years ago my life as a canvas with rolling grass hills. And he showed me as an egg corn and he stuck me in the ground. And he said, this is you when you die. Boom. And that tree sprung up and got covered with egg corns. How do you say it in Alabama? Acorns or? Acorns. Acorns? I don't know. He's a transplant. I say acorns. You're from where? People say acorns, egg corns, but you know what I mean, right? The fruit of an oak tree. So the oak tree was covered with the fruit of an oak tree. <laughs> and these egg corns started dropping and falling all over the ground. And yet there was rolling hills of bare grass. And it was one tree. And that was me. I sprung up. And yet all that I saw on the tree was what was planted. Egg corns. The same kind as. 
Some rolled down the hill. Some fell into crevices. Some the squirrels took all over into other hills and buried on the ground. Some the blue jays picked up and were flying and squawking and dropping them on the way. I saw this. And after a few years, the whole canvas was solid, massive oak trees. And the Lord said, do you see? Because one seed died. He said, that is your life. I went, okay. Dead. <laughs> I'm done. No account of a suffer wrong. It ain't about me. Dead. Count me dead. Because I want that to be me when I stand before him. I don't want them hills all grassy and empty and have that little egg corn on the picture. I don't want a tree half wilted and broken down. I don't want a tree dried up. I want to be a fruitful, fruitful plant that reproduced. Watch, that same tree that grew might sit there for a hundred years and every fall drop them things on the ground and every other tree after. And next thing you know, you can't even measure the multiplication of one seed that died. That's how valuable and important your life is within your sphere of influence or he'd have never shed his blood to redeem you. If I really get that, do you think I'm going to have issues? Or do you think I'm going to stay a tree? So I'm going to what? Set my mind on that. Why? Because I died. My life is hidden in Christ. And when Christ appears, who is my life? I'm going to appear with him in glory. And then people go, duh, now I get it. No wonder he was like that. He really knew him. I thought he was goofy. <laughs> and it says, men will fear God and give honor to him for your namesake or because of your life. Men will go, whoa. And it'll click. So when Christ appears, here's my life, I'm going to appear with him. Therefore, because, that means because this is true, in light of what I just said, put to death. He didn't say manage. Put to death your members which are on the earth. It's amazing. The first thing always mentioned is your sexual arena. Fornication. That's sex drive. Sex. He didn't say manage it. He said put it to death. The way you know it to be. I wonder if that came from Adam. Put it to death and find out what it really looks like in me. I know that's intent. I got, man, I feel wheels spinning all the time on that one. The day, the morning after I got saved, I realized my definition of manhood could not possibly be the kingdom. Because it was at the expense of another person. Nobody's on the earth to satisfy a desire in my life. Can I be bold and raw with what I said to the Lord that day when you weren't there crying and crying and crying? I'm going to be graphic. Don't get offended at me. I saw God, it was Holy Spirit. He showed me my definition of manhood that I acquired it from when I found a pornographic magazine at age 11 on an empty loading dock on a Sunday afternoon and went, that's where it started. And then locker rooms and boy conversations and and all of a sudden, I'm trained and taught by the lie. And now I think I know what a man is. And on that morning after I got saved, I was crying and you weren't there. And I was rocking on my floor. And I said, God, my manhood definition came to the forefront. And I said, God, you couldn't have made me this way. It's completely self-centered and focused. This didn't come from you. This came from the locker room, from the world, from a magazine. I said, there's no way Adam was walking in the garden with an erection and saying, what should I do with this thing? So you made a woman. I said, you have to deliver me. I've been deceived. And I can't even tell you the glory of how God touched me. We probably ought to be willing to put that stuff on the altar and let the fire burn it. 
I talked to three pastors about this in my life intimately and they all cut me off and said, whoa, stop, you're freaking me out. I love my sex life, stop. Do you hear what they said? I love my sex life. I wonder if it's not your sex life. I wonder if you have a covenant of love and it's not about your sex life. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you ask Jesus about what I'm saying because watch this. You don't counterfeit $1 bills. And there's no area on the earth of humanity that's been exploited and perverted more than the one I'm talking about. You will find none that's been exploited, twisted, and on the forefront more than sexuality. That's because there's an incredible value, both holy root and lump there in truth that we failed to seek. So we just wrap Christian language around the world's way. Yeah. I want something a little deeper than, hey, it's been three days, honey, huh? I want something a little deeper than you scratching an itch. I want I love you. And you're the only one that I can be in this with. Because I've given myself to you and all that is mine is yours. And all of a sudden, woman was made out of the fullness of God in man in the garden. He didn't make another lump of clay. He made Jason in his image to walk in him and be in his image and to be filled and complete and full in him. And he looked at Jason and said, whoa, it isn't good that man be alone. He didn't make another lump of clay and call it Tina. He reached into what was already there and one in him brought out Tina and made one, two out of one so two could enjoy one. Yeah. So here's the deal. If Tina's in Jason's life, it ought to be because of the fullness of God in Jason, not the need of Jason. Because woman was created to be loved by God and receive the pure love of God through the man in that relationship and open herself up to what edifies, increases, builds, and brings the best on here. And it's a total thing of trust and unity and oneness. And she opens up herself and even opens up her gates. And he comes into that secret holy place and two are one in that place. You can find it in Hebrews 10. It's a spiritual thing. You enter into the holy place through the sprinkling of blood and the veil of flesh. <laughs> it's a spiritual thing. He gave you the privilege of experiencing that through covenant intercourse where man goes into a woman through the veil of her flesh. There's a breaking of a veil. There's a sprinkling of blood. There's blood in the semen. There's blood covenant. The veil doesn't grow back because two have become one. And man goes into woman, into the depth of who she is, into the most intimate place, into the core of the woman, and two are one in that place. Two conceive in that place, and their love is multiplied and fruitful on the earth. We've turned it into one night stands, sex drive, orgasms. Shame on us. We've wrapped spiritual language around the world, and we're missing the glory of God. <laughs> I don't need my wife, I love her. And I don't chase her around and drag her by the hair with a club. <laughs> and it's not, well, your body is not your own. That's obligatory. And it's twisted, and we ought to knock it off. I'm sorry I'm being so raw with this thing, but it's just the way it's in me, man. He reached into the fullness of God in the man. He's naming all the animals and God's going, yeah, awesome, okay, whoa. He didn't correct him. He didn't upstage him. He didn't belittle him. He didn't say, you can't call it a giraffe. That sounds stupid. If Adam said giraffe, guess what it was? Because he's flowing in the wisdom of God. He's given authority to subdue. He, God looks at Adam and sees himself and says, man, all the animals have a comparable. There's none comparable to him. You're not a weaker vessel, women. You're not in the sense of a lack of value. He reaches into the man and brings out the woman. 
out of the fullness of God and the man and makes what was one, two, so two can enjoy the beauty of one. Two souls, two wills, two emotional makeups surrendered and dead to themselves for the common cause of his image and the synergism of one plus one is a stronger one. That sure beats you do for me, I'll do for you. Hey, a marriage is 50-50 and a lot of work. My wife's very liberated knowing she's not under the pressure of breaking my heart and failing me. (laughs) That's petty to me at this point. (laughs) Oh my goodness. We think the people that we're closest to can hurt us the most. That's what we say. But they're the people you say I love and love takes no account of a suffer wrong because it doesn't seek its own. We probably just need them more than we understand love. And we're depending on them for our sake instead of laying down our life for theirs. Come on, if you're going to talk about living love, we probably ought to bring it. And we've hurt each other in our own homes. You've got to get that stuff out of there. You've got to let there be no unresolved stuff. You gotta, I don't care if you did each other wrong. I mean, I care. I wish we didn't. But if we did, you ought to take a message like this and say, duh, what was I thinking? Forgive me, honey. Don't elbow Say, oh my goodness, he's talking to me. He's not, don't listen for your spouse. Listen for you. Because if you're listening for your spouse, then I'm surely talking to you. If you're sitting there thinking, boy, I hope she's listening. I hope he's listening. You've missed the whole point. God's shouting to you. You guys follow me? And late. Good but late. Eh, you got to give a little and get a little. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Good but late. <laughs> put to death. Didn't say manage. It said put to death. Your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. It's all idolatry. That's putting something above him, his image, and knowing him. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons of disobedience and what you yourselves all were when you walked and lived in them. So we all walked and lived in this, but guess what? We put off the old man, we're sanctified, we're set apart, we're not in that life anymore. Whoa. Watch. But now you yourselves. You ought to get this language because it's not deliverance. It's not a prayer issue. You yourself. Oh, I hope you're hearing me. This is the greatest privilege of your life to restore integrity and a clear conscience that God allows you yourself to deal with your own heart and get alone with Him and be real. Don't you pawn it off on ministry. Don't you say, well, I can't get free. You yourself, watch, are to put off these. Ang- he said put off, not manage. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Now let me ask you a serious question. How can you put off anger without getting trapped in works and trying to bite your lip and not be angry? How does that happen? How can you possibly put off anger without biting your lip and getting trapped in the works of the flesh? Pretty good question, huh? Because be honest, isn't that what we try to do? We read that we're to put off anger so we try not to be angry anymore. And then when we feel anger coming or we get angry, we feel like we're failing and we judge and question our own heart, put a veil over our face and keep us from the very one that's going to change us. Here's how you put off anger. Watch. He tells you. Well, first he says, don't lie to one another. Why don't you lie to one another? It's simple. Because you've put off the old man and his deeds. See, you didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. You put off the old man and his deeds. (laughs) When you get saved, it doesn't mean go to heaven. It means healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound. It means brought back and restored back to truth and original value, standing before God as if you've never sinned. (laughs) You put off the old man and his deeds, but look what you do. You put on the... Who is he? The new man, and who's he? He's the one that's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So how do you put off anger? It's in your relationship. It's in your intimacy. It's not in your New Year's Reza. When you get alone with God, here's what happens. 
You begin to see stuff like that in the Word. And you say, Father, I thank you. This is much more than a prayer. I'm telling you, you're sitting on your bed reading this thing right here. And you look at this and you just stop every other sentence and you pray out what it's saying. And you say, God, I thank you. I didn't incorporate you into my life. I didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. You've come inside of me. I'm setting my mind on you. You did this because you knew there was greater value to my life. I was trapped in a lie. I was living by human reasoning and wisdom and I had become what Adam had become, but now I'm born again. And God, I thank you for the honor of being filled with your image and consumed by your spirit. Thank you, God. You didn't make me to be angry and offended and hurt and jealous. All those things I used to think were normal, I realized you didn't make me that way. I became that way when man fell and sinned. But Jesus, you took it off of me and I thank you, God, that no man owes me anything. I freely give myself and you're teaching my heart to love, causing my eyes to agree with you in truth, causing me to see what you behold. I thank you, God, never again. Lord, never again will these things drive me. And if they even whisper, this truth will crush those voices. God, I am a lover. I am a man of God. I am a tree ripe for the picking. There is fruit all over me. That's prayer. You're putting off the old. And in the process, you're putting on the new. Now watch. You're saved by grace through... When you release faith in the truth, this beautiful thing called grace comes. It's God's working ability. It comes to shape and fashion and mold you. And all of a sudden, in that place, grace makes what you believe is possible your reality. And all of a sudden, where you used to get angry and had a short fuse, you don't see it the same and the fuse isn't there. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, and now you weep and love him all the more because you realize in that secret place you're being changed. You're not trying to not react. There's no reaction in you. All of a sudden you realize you don't have the button. And guess what it does? It takes you back to that secret place to him because you so enjoy what he's doing in you and you so see it's possible. And he builds you from faith to faith and takes you from glory to glory. Or you just try not to be angry, feel like you're failing, get frustrated and give up and say, oh, well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. You know, I'm that type of personality and I do have a short fuse and it runs in my family. <laughs> what family? <laughs> Why don't you draw a line in the blood and call no man on earth your father and go back to the beginning where you have one father in heaven and... Because the word father means come forth from. And the only reason you have a biological dad and natural inheritance is because God said come forth way back then. That's where you find you. <laughs> you guys all right? Look at verse 12. Let me back up to 10. You're putting on the new man all the time in prayer. Father, you've made me to love. I thank you that no man today owes me anything. When I go to work, I thank you, God. I see my employees. And Lord, I feel like I've missed it and I've blown my testimony the last three years and misunderstood. But you know what? They're going to see the integrity of change and repentance and character. And in time, you're going to change that resume. And God, what they remembered from six months ago is going to be vanquished because of the next year of just solid manifestation of your heart and your love. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in my life. I'm so encouraged to go to work and shine. Thank you, God. That sure beats all. What's the use? I blew my testimony, man. If I try to act like that now, they'll just call me a hypocrite anyway. So what? So you're going to live half and half? <laughs> Come on. Let them see that God changes people. And let your new, fresh faith and foundation of understanding so supersede the last years of memory that after a while they can't even remember where you've been because they're so touched by who you've become. So the only way you can fail is by not getting up and running the race. You get it? I know I'm long and late, and I'm so sorry, but I'll just read this real quick. Therefore, because this is true, the elect of God, as the elect of God, be holy, or holy and beloved. You're holy and beloved. As the elect of God, holy and beloved. He's not telling you to be holy. He's telling you you've been made holy and beloved. Boy, it would do you good to stand in the presence of God when nobody's watching. Father, I thank you. You've made me holy in your sight through the blood. I don't take that lightly. You look at me through the finished work, and I thank you that you build. 
my integrity, my demonstration of life to match that holiness. I don't, I'm not striving to be holy. You've made me holy and I'll receive it. You've made me blameless and you absolutely love me. Thank you for the confidence you've burned into my heart. You are so for me and not against me. That will empower you to live holy. Put on. See? Put on. Guess what? You're putting on. You're still praying. Father, I just thank you that I'm a merciful man. You've made me merciful. You didn't show me this kind of mercy so I've obtained mercy. You showed me this mercy to become it. God, you've so overwhelmed my heart in the way that you've loved me. And I thank you, God, you've empowered me to overwhelm someone else's heart by loving them. And truly, they'll get a picture of you. Thank you that I can multiply this revelation and be the body of Christ and embody you and manifest you. What an honor to be alive in your spirit. I put on tender mercies, God, and I thank you. I bear with one another and I am done complaining, God. I'm seeing the best about my brothers and sisters. Guess what you're doing in prayer? You're putting on. Because in prayer you put off. Do you get it? That sure beats biting your lip and thinking you're failing or trying hard because if you try hard and feel like you're succeeding, you'll get haughty and high-minded and you'll think you deserve a trophy someday or something. You are what you are by the grace of God. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. Did you ever hear the church say, boy, I need to pray for patience. And a brother say, man, you better be careful praying for patience. God will give it to you, man. Listen, it's not the issue. When you're praying for patience, you're actually saying, I'm not perfected in love because love is patient. Why don't you just become loving? You don't have to pray for patience. <laughs> When you say you're praying for patience, it's an indictment that you haven't been formed in love. Okay. I don't know if you all got that. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as, even as Christ forgave you. Under the law, you're forgiving to be forgiven. Under grace, you're already forgiven, so you become forgiveness. He said, no, Jesus said, when you stand praying, you need to forgive, at least you're not forgiven. He said that before he shed his blood, before the cross. Now on the New Testament covenant, through his blood, after he's raised from the dead, Paul said, look it. He said, the reason you're forgiven is because you're forgiven. You're not forgiving to be forgiven. You're forgiven because you've tasted the beauty of it and you've become it. Forgiving to be forgiven is works. It has no sense of relationship or heart. It's duty. It's, you're just a Christian militant. You're, you're just a soldier without it's impersonal when you forgive because you're forgiven you realize what he's done for you you've accepted it you've worn it and now you can't see anybody else different because if he saw you that way he sees every man that way so why are you going to forgive because you're already forgiven but above all these things guess what you're going to put on you're going to put on love god i thank you you've made me to love you didn't make me to live for myself you made me for your image you made me to love and God, I thank you. And I sit in my bed and I muse and meditate in the Word and I think about Jesus. I think about how they treated Him and how He never let anything change Him. I read things like James 3, 13, who's wise among you? Who really understands? Let them show by the way they live their life. But if you have envy or selfishness in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom never came from God. Earthly, sensual, demonic. And where there's envy and self-seeking, there's every evil work. But the wisdom from above is first pure peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. I read that kind of stuff, man. And I'm like, yeah. And I just position my heart for him. Do you get it? Why don't you stand to your feet with me, would you? Please. Yeah, Jeff, maybe you can just help me. Listen, can you tell I'm crying out my heart long and strong and hard? I know I went long. I got so emotional this time, man, I don't even know what to do. And I know it was long, this session was long. Forgive me for that. And I know we're coming back soon, but if you can come back, come back. You've been riding it out all this time. I'm telling you, we're going to preach something about the power of the cross and the blood tonight. I'm telling you, heaven's coming in this room, man. And God's going to respond to the truth. And you ain't going to have to produce nothing or hide nothing. You will not be able to hold him back. Yeah. I'm just telling you, there's things coming out of folks' bodies, and it has no choice. Are you hearing me? See, if I didn't know what I'm saying, I'm hyping and I'm a false prophet and you have to stone me when it don't happen. 
That ain't even an option for me right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus speaks better things. You can't stop the power of his blood. And if you see it clear and preach it clear, it comes in the room. And there ain't nothing nobody can do. Do you know hell can't stop the mercy of God? Do you know that you don't deserve everlasting life, but you've got it through Christ? And there ain't nothing hell can do to stop everlasting life except deceive you from receiving it. Because he can't stop the gift. He just tries to keep you from opening it. But the gift's already here. And those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign as kings in this life through the one. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Come on, man. You know you rip open them gifts at Christmas. We get that false hope. We think, oh, you shouldn't have. And you know you're glad they did. <laughs> what? You got me a gift? Oh, no, you shouldn't have. And inside you're going, woohoo, you better have. Yeah, ow! <laughs> Why don't you just do that with the gospel? Instead of saying, oh, you shouldn't have. Watch, watch. This isn't arrogant. The Lord showed me this a long time ago. Yes, you should have. You should have sent your son. Why wouldn't you? I see it now. Your love and you knew who I was the whole time. For you let me dry up and die and never manifest truth wouldn't even be love. Love never fails. You never lost sight of me. You wouldn't change your mind about me. No matter how lost I was and vile and angry and empty, you said you're more than that, son. Yes, you should have sent your son because my life is more than what I was living and you knew it all the while. And your love qualified sending your son. And Jesus, you came because you knew me all the time. Thank you for the gospel. <laughs> yes you should have come yes you should have died for me because I'm a lot more than I ever knew but you knew so how couldn't you come there was no one going to keep you from coming you were slain before the foundation of the world come on that better speak loud to you or you'll just have issues that ought to speak way louder than life <laughs> <laughs> tonight I'm going to preach redemption we're going to pray for some folks it's going to be fun last week a lady I preached redemption a lady had HPV in her blood incurable she had a whole lot of I know it's gross sounding but in private but it's, it's just real she had a whole pile of genital warts she made a mistake, man. She lived promiscue and the thing bit her and she wants to get married. She'd love to have a relationship. She's embarrassed. She's shamed. She, she thinks, well, I can't get married because I'll drag that into my relationship. I'll always have to fight it. How does that even look? How do I, what, man, I'm messing. So now she's a Christian, loves Jesus, and she feels like she's got this baggage called HPV. So I preached this message and she came up front. And we prayed for her and she got in her house and the Lord said, hey, don't be afraid to check your body and see what I've done. She ran to check her body and there wasn't one genital wart on her body. And now she's getting her blood tested to just show that that thing's out so her conscience is free to move into a relationship. Last year alone and through emails and testimonies, I lost count of hepatitis totally removed from bodies totally lots of scars from cutters vanishing a month ago I saw a man that mutilated his body every trace of mutilation came off of his flesh right now as if he never put a razor blade to his skin why because what the blood forgives the body of Jesus removes and if that man will never stand before God and answer for the sins committed then why is it still judging his flesh let your spirit, soul, and body be blameless, sanctified, set apart, and blameless till the coming of the Son of God. If any man's in Christ, new creature, old things pass away. Behold, all things. You slept around when you were 18 and you got an HPV in your blood 
and now you're 23 and you're born again and wish you didn't sleep around, you'll never be judged for the one that did because if you could change it, you would go back and do it, but you can't, but you changed. And you won't be judged for where you've been, you'll be judged for what you've become. So I guess that HPV needs assaulted, violated and driven out by the power of His love. <laughs> That's coming in this house tonight. I'm about ready to roll with it now. <laughs> You come on back. You come on back. I got to let you all take a break and stretch and use the potty. You'll be shaking and I'll think it's my anointing and preaching or something. You'll say, no, I just got to pee, brother. You had me here for hours. I... <laughs> Lift your hands to heaven. Listen, you're the only one that can keep you from him. Unbelief, believing a lie, not letting the gospel be the loudest voice in your life. It's the only thing that can keep you from him. If there's something telling you you can't be with Him, it is not God. Because He's given you every reason to be with Him. So right now, from your heart, thank Him. He loves you. From your heart, thank Him. You're clean. Come on, you release faith tonight and or today. And let this message mark you. Let grace burn in you. Don't you ever put on fig leaves, ever. Don't you run from Him. You run to Him. You let Him father you. Even when you know you're absolutely wrong, Run to Him and let Him make you righteous and make you wiser and sharper and more sincere and more fine-tuned than ever before. Don't you be condemned. You run to your Father and you let Him raise you up in Him. You let Him father you. You let Him father you. You tell Him, I want you. I want to become love. This man is crying out with passion and I'm saying, yes, God. I don't want to carry offense. I don't want to carry bitterness. I don't want to carry frustration. I don't want my heart in a place outside of you. I stretch my hands to you, God, and I say yes to your image. Yes to destiny. Yes to the love of God. I'm done just seeking blessing and favor and prosperity and full vats and barns. I want my heart full. I want my heart full of who you are. I want to be unmovable and shakable. I want to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. I understand that I'm on the earth for one reason, that when men see me, they get a real good look of you. So have your way in me, great Holy Spirit. Come and fashion me and thank you for making me like you. Do that great work in me and I rejoice in what you're doing you talk to him like that right now come on don't just let me lead him you tell him that you let your heart be before the lord and you tell him you believe he loves you you tell him you believe that he sees you holy and pure and blameless and you are beloved go ahead and tell him let the tree become good right now make the tree good make the tree good Man, if you've got to repent and say, God, this thing in my life, it's not been you. I've allowed it to gray me out and violate my conscience. I'm done with it. I am more than that. God, this thing doesn't have power over who you are in my life. And I'm sanctifying myself even by a confession. And I'm saying that is not who I am. You're greater than that in me. And you're the one that sanctifies me. God, I say yes. I say yes. Father, thank you, 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 thank you. This won't put you on the spot at all. Just sing something over the people, whatever God, just sing something, whatever gets right in you. Take your time and know that what you're singing is for the moment. I just kept hearing Jeff, 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 and I just, it just, God wants to release something through your heart. Sing it over the people. Whatever comes is going to be dead on the money. It's going to be good. Just be patient. Let's receive the grace of God. Learn to receive grace and become. Amen. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Thank you, sweet Jesus. And I'm more than what these ashes say. <laughs> For they will fade away when He comes for me. When He's singing like that, man, you lift up your heart and you say, Thanks for coming. Thanks for making all things new. 
I am not the same Respond when the he truth. looks at me. I am the rose, the joy for which you died. And this I know, I move you with delight. And when my heart condemns on every side, I take refuge in the truth. That's right, the truth. I am the rose I to you. I am the road. 